My goal is to find an exploration company that will build a mine. Come around this way and we're gonna walk up a little further here. In this video, myself and Jay Lutz from The Deep Dive travel to the Sonoran Desert in Mexico to visit with my old pal, John Mark Stoudy, in search for gold and other treasure at the La Union Project. You know, porphyry means big homogeneous moneymaker. If you're new to mining and want to learn the basics, this is the video for you. Cold January night and we are leaving to Hermosillo, Mexico to meet with Riverside Resources. I'll uh, be having a quick stop in Toronto to uh, pick up small cap Steve. You can see here Jojo, we're just making our connecting flight on time on our way to Hermosillo. Hermosillo. <laughs> Welcome to the first episode of DD On The Go. Today, we're looking at project generators. But before we get started, a little background. After years of learning some really hard lessons in venture capital investing, with a particular focus on junior mining, myself and Jay Lutz from The Deep Dive are embarking on a journey to Mexico to finally get boots on the ground and see what's happening with an exploration company from a first-hand perspective. Now, my goal for the next year is to visit at least 10 mining sites and share this experience with you, our audience. And hopefully from this, you're gonna have a better understanding of what you're looking at when you read company news releases, read financial statements, or look at a company's investor presentation. So being the first episode of this series, I thought I'd reach out to my close friend, John Mark Stoudy. John Mark's been really generous with teaching me about geology over the years, which I like because he's a Harvard-educated geo, which I can't confirm, but I imagine is a graduating class of like 10 students. You have to really like rocks to study geology at one of the top universities in the world. So John Mark has a company called Riverside, which is a project generator. And I find them fascinating because Riverside's been around since 2007 and trade around 12 cents with 74 million shares outstanding. Yet, after all these years, they've never done a rollback, something extremely uncommon for a 17-year-old penny stock. Over the years, Riverside has spun out various projects. Most recently, they spun out Capiton Mining, which saw shareholders of Riverside receive one share of Capiton Mining for every four shares of Riverside they held. Kind of like receiving a dividend. Today, they're working on three main categories of projects. Firstly, they're working on a rare earth project in British Columbia. Then they have a precious metals package in Ontario they're calling Blue Jay. And lastly, they have a series of projects in Mexico, one of which is the La Union project in the Sonoran Desert, which we're about to go see. Carbonate replacement deposits over here. And uh, purple units means uh, Precambrian and Cambrian. So quickly, let's touch on project generators. To give you a quick explainer, project generators are mining companies that look for a project to get their hands on and add value. They could acquire this project via staking or buying a project from another company. Then they're gonna add value through drilling, exploration, permitting, or maybe even just holding on to a property and waiting for the market to turn. Not unlike buying an undervalued stock. Now, when a project generator looks to capitalize on a project, they could do this in one of two ways. They could either sell the project to another company, or they could create a new company with a new management team and give shareholders of the project generator shares of the new company. Project generators are kind of an oddball in the junior mining space. Now, I'd argue that most mining companies are somewhat of a project generator and that most mining companies hold on to multiple projects and they'd be open to selling any of these projects for the right price. The difference is project generators are explicit about their goal to offload their projects. But of course, you'd have to think that if any of these project generators hit something with Bonanza grades, they'd probably no longer be a project generator. Instead, they'd probably focus their entire company around that discovery. The hoist would have been what's fallen over here, and then the shaft goes down here, 100 meters down. Wow, that's deep. All right, so now that you're up to speed, let's get moving on our trip. When you're heading to the Sonoran Desert from Toronto, there's typically two routes. You're normally going to head down to Mexico City and then fly up to Hermosillo, which is annoying because you have to spend hours going out of your way. Or you can fly down to Arizona and just drive down. 
Well, we chose to fly straight to Mexico, embarking on an 18-hour trip to see La Union. Next, we were greeted at the airport by my old pal, John Mark. And I'll tell you something, this guy has a lot of energy. From the time we arrived to the time we left, it felt like he never stopped talking. In Mexico, Nogales, in the state of Sonora. So between Are we that Arizona, close to the US? We then got to meet some of the GEOs and board members for dinner, and we ate, well, you guessed it, Mexican food. After that, we got to check out La Ruins, which is a food truck area of Hermosillo. I ate some more food there, including this Philadelphia-style burrito. That's really good. Good, isn't it? Next, we checked out a bar, and then Riverside's geologist Julian suggested we head down to watch Hermosillo's Winter League baseball team, the Naranjeros, which I found odd because we went down to catch the game at like 11 p.m. The stadium blew me away. It was like an MLB quality ballpark, and it was named after the great Fernando Valenzuela. The team even had Isaac Paredes playing, who's coming off a pretty big year with the Tampa Bay Rays. Anyways, the home team ended up winning, and we got to experience quite the party. The next morning, we were about to embark on a trip from Hermosillo to the middle of the Sonoran Desert. So John Mark had us up at 5 a.m. so we'd be able to catch the sun in time to film. After driving four and a half hours from Hermosillo to Caborca, one of our last stops before heading out to site was a stop at a local mining store. The type where generations ago, miners would line up to purchase picks and shovels before they headed out to strike it rich in the gold rush. And let me tell you, apparently the women who work in mining in the area are stacked. But we weren't here for picks and shovels. Instead, we had to purchase truck flags, which are used to make local hunters aware of our presence to avoid being shot at. Interestingly, the La Union Mine is located on a local ranch, where hunters search for bighorn sheep at an incredible cost of $50,000 a tag. Driving through the desert was kind of cold, but everything you'd expect. Cactus, sand, and dust. After over an hour of driving through the desert, we arrived at La Union. What we see in the background here is what remains of the La Union mine. So this mining site here was last operational in the 70s by the Pinoles Mining Company. Located here in the western portion of Sonora State, La Union was a small-scale mine that first opened back in the 1950s, operated by Panoles, one of the largest mining names in Mexico and local families. At the time, the mine averaged grades of up to 20 grams per ton gold, 300 grams per ton silver, 20% lead, and 5% zinc in what is known as a polymetallic deposit. The head frame has fallen over since its last use in the 1970s, but at one point that structure towered over us, enabling the miners to hoist ore out of the ground from the mine shaft before it was processed, loaded into trucks, and sent off to market. The dumps here serve as evidence of this grueling work. This is, used to be a building or maybe a bank in the 70s where people used to save money, where people gain working in the in Union Mine. Well, it may not look like much aside from some ruins. What used to be the bank here is the key to the whole operation. Not because it keeps the company's money, but because it kept employee money. It allowed the mine to keep money in what was really a closed loop system. Miners at the end of the week would line up to collect their pay. But because there's nothing around for miles, they'd go spend their pittance at the saloon or grocery store on site, which would have been owned by the mining company. That money would then be deposited back at the bank, and the cycle would repeat. A capitalist dream. Now, the type of deposit Riverside is searching for in La Union is what's called a CRD, which stands for Carbonate Replacement Deposit. If you're new to mining, I'm going to make this as simple as possible and get really basic, assuming you know nothing. The earth is made up of four main layers, the inner core, outer core, mantle, and crust. It's always changing inside and out. Over time, the surface of the Earth is reshaped by forces like wind, water, movement in the Earth's crust, which creates plate tectonics and volcanic eruptions. This means that a place that was once at the bottom of an ocean could now be dry land, far away from any ocean. Imagine a sedimentary rock, such as limestone. 
This rock formed millions of years ago, originally under an ocean. Layers of sediment accumulated, compressed, and eventually transformed into rock. Which might be hard to imagine how it's no longer underwater, but that's because the Earth rearranges surfaces over millions of years. Things get intriguing when there's volcanic activity beneath this rock. For those new to geology, the Earth's core is filled with intensely hot molten material. Sometimes this molten material, along with hot gases, makes its way upwards. When it does, and creates an intrusion beneath the limestone, it brings heat and mineral-rich steam. This steam, carrying elements like copper and gold, permeates the pores of the sedimentary rock, including a chemical reaction that alters the rock's mineral composition. In our example, the limestone might transform into minerals like calcopyrite, calcasite, or boronite. This is fascinating because these new minerals contain elements such as copper and gold, which are valuable for mining. Oh my God. Did you <laughs> walked really? it in? I'm like, oh, okay, go back on. Back on. <laughs> Getting back specifically to Riverside, John Mark was eager to explain to us how this geology applies specifically at the La Union project. So eager that I had to put it into four wheel drive while climbing up the side of a hill. Steve's climbing up here and Trainer. Don't worry, I filmed it so you can send it to go. <laughs> and Jay ran straight into a cactus as we were chasing John Mark up the rock face. Anyways, by the time we got to the top of the hill, John Mark was rather out of breath himself. But I'm not sure if that was from the hike or simply from the excitement of talking about rocks. And then. So we're right at the top of the limestone. What he proceeded to say was that the current stratigraphy of the project contains 100 to 200 meter thick wide zones of limestone, which provides a potential for a thick ore body of massive sulfides. In simple terms, that means potential for those desirable metals that are worth money in the bank, such as copper, gold, and silver. Now, obviously more work is needed to be done to further prove out the system. But what does that exploration look like? When doing mining exploration, before even putting a drill in the ground, explorers rely on two main categories to figure out where to drill. Geophysics and geochemistry. Geophysics often involves using a helicopter or a drone to get a sense of the magnetic or gravity structure of the area, whereas geochemistry involves taking samples from the ground and looking at the mineral composition. We got to see some examples of sampling on our tour. There are four main types of sampling we learned about. The first is soil sampling, which simply involves taking soil from the ground and putting it in a bag with proper labeling. Secondly, we learned about chip sampling, which involves taking chips from the rocks on the surface. Thirdly, we learned about channel sampling, which involves cutting out a strip of rock from the surface to get a better sense of mineralization. And lastly, we learned about selective sampling, which is the targeted collection of samples from locations that are specifically chosen based on prior knowledge, geological indications, or preliminary exploration data that suggests a higher potential for mineralization. Selective sampling is something retail investors should really be cautious about. Companies often use it to market their stock to newbie investors, but they often present selective sampling as if it was randomly chosen and use those grades with a deceptive headline to try to get some buying into their stock. But in reality, sampling is just a way of gathering data to determine where drill targeting might make sense, if at all. Next, we headed off to the bodega. The bodega is where Riverside stores all their old drill core. And let me tell you, they had lots of old drill core. Okay, so when a company drills, they use a massive power drill that pulls out cylinder-shaped pieces of rock that can be hundreds of meters long in aggregate, called core. That rock will then be split in half lengthwise and then assayed, which means a lab assesses the mineral composition of the core. The other half of the core gets stored for quality control purposes or in case there is a need to reassay any parts of the drill hole. So this one is going to be a drill hole, that's how it's marked. This is an SV, that, that means Suaki Verde. This is one of the projects from the copper portfolio that's in Sonora. And this is the, the year, pretty much, so 11. 
right? You can see all the 11 is consistent. 2011. 2011, and this is the whole. So whole is always at the end, then we have the year and you have the project in the, in the, in the name. Something I found super fascinating is a tool that exploration companies started using in the last decade called an XRF gun. An XRF gun is a handheld tool that looks a bit like a science fiction ray gun, but is actually used for analyzing rocks and minerals on the spot. It's like a handheld assay lab that isn't quite as accurate, but it's hard not to look at it and think how it's changed the game. Even from a compliance standpoint, you can't help but wonder what risks it could mean for the people on the ground who have the ability to scan drill core as it comes up and what loose lips could do to a stock from leaky information after a strong reading. What we can see here in the screen of the XRF gun is approximately the value of calcium, iron, copper, zinc. We use this, this grade to know what samples we want to send to the lab and what samples we're not going gonna, gonna, gonna to send to the lab. On this trip, with all the traveling, it gave us lots of time to talk about mining with John Mark. One of the things we chatted about was the disconnect between retail investors and big mining companies and big mining companies' eagerness to help fund these projects. Recently, there are many examples of major mining companies working with early stage explorers to help fund their projects after years of underinvestment. However, retail investors don't really seem to see it the same way. The, the Roundup Conference in Vancouver and then the PDAC, our dance card will be filled and we're getting inflow of interest all the time because basically the majors have given up trying to find it themselves and they've really, they're booming. The metal prices are doing fairly well and the guys are making lots of money and they need to replace their reserves, their resources and their mines. So these guys are tasked with coming to us as the juniors. So we actually are finding this really a good interest and our job as Marin has said is for us to go and get good projects and we're doing that and we're finding that the guys are, are messaging us weekly wishing to do it to get projects but of course sometimes when you invest in a company and the stock price doesn't go up you have to let the investor relations department know how you feel you don't even remember the numbers you put it in the deck John Mark wanted to put six I had to like bring it out to four for work program, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it could do sex. It'd be really good yeah, to do yeah, sex. What did I say? What did I say? What did I say? What did I say? Exactly. <laughs> we you love John We love John <laughs> Please tell the camera what is it that you do at Riverside. <laughs> We're going to try to change the subject. <laughs> Grant, how many numbers are there to even know? <laughs> One. I mean, what's that number? <laughs> Six. <laughs> The jabroni. <laughs> but don't worry. As I always do, oh, we ended up Super making fans. up the next day. Super fans. What's Just a couple of besties hanging out in Hermosillo Mountain. There you go. There you go. Come on, John. Great. Actually, I think it's worth This was the first trip to a mining site for both Jay and myself. We learned a lot, mostly how difficult it is to find a mine. After this trip, I can see why data is so important in this business and why many of the more sophisticated investors I know say things like, I only invest in a mining project that's been drilled like Swiss cheese. Of course, against this backdrop in junior mining, you have companies that are striving to add enough value to their projects to outstrip any potential dilution that could occur when they need to raise money. Now, this is no small feat given how volatile commodity prices can be and how junior mining investors tend to want to chase the latest hot sector. Something I probably ask John Mark about every time I see him is why doesn't Riverside have a lithium project or a uranium project or something else? He usually responds by saying it's because I only do real things and I don't see anything out there that catches my eye. From my view, project generators need to have projects that are ready for whatever the flavor of the month may be. I will say that I'm optimistic about Riverside's Rare Earths project in BC given how China and the US are treating Rare Earth like a political football. This trip really motivated me to continue to get out there and put boots on the ground. In the words of the great Peter Lynch, whoever turns over the most rocks wins the game. Well, in mining, this is true in the literal sense. But in the figurative sense, it means avoiding the bad actors and the companies that are just going to dilute you down as a shareholder. This is why I've always appreciated my friendship with John Mark. I feel like he's done a great job of managing Riverside's share count. But now, with the cash position he's built up thanks to various option arrangements, I'm expecting him to take one of those rocks he's turned over and turn it into a major discovery. And then behind it is the Union Mine. The Union